recorded webinar as the person just alluded to. Uh, so just uh, a heads up there. I'm going to share my screen now and we can get going. So I'll start off uh, first uh, with some technical difficulties. And before we get started today, I just want to recognize that colonization uh, and the institutional oppressors that continue to permeate in our society have dramatically impacted Indigenous people who call this land home. The host of disproportionate impacts towards Indigenous people are, spar are far reaching and span generations. There is a link between colonization, which is fundamentally a process of violence and disconnection that operates at multiple levels, and the topics that we're here to talk about, mainly safe supply, overdose, the war on drugs uh, in the land commonly referred to as Canada, and the disproportionate impact of criminalization and hepatitis C and HIV AIDS and overdose crisis. A land acknowledgement is not enough, not even remotely, when it comes to eliminating structural and historical barriers erected through colonization, but it is a small step towards humility and committing to a relationship uh, of reconciliation. And so it's with that spirit today that I am very privileged as a white settler on stolen lands to be on the land of the Lekwungen speaking people and that of the Songhees Esquimalt and Wissanic people. I live at the intersections of the Cowichan tribe and the Malahat First Nations, and I also work in Suck First Nations, and I'm very privileged to do so. I would also like to acknowledge that this presentation is made possible by people with lived and living experience of drug use, sharing their knowledge and experience with paid educators, service providers, and without their generosity, this presentation, this project, and a lot of the work that many of you out there do uh, may not be possible. My name is Corey Ranger, and I'm a registered nurse. I'm the clinical nurse lead of AVI and Solid Safer Project here on Lekwungen Territory, as well as the president for the Harm Reduction Nurses Association. I'm very uh, happy to see you all today and to be speaking to you today about the Victoria Safer Initiative and Safe Supply. And I'll let Megan introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan uh, Brown. I'm a settler. Um, RN here on the Kwangan territory as well, Victoria, BC. Um, I work as a casual registered nurse on the SAFER project, but I also helped out Corey a little bit um, with the development of the SAFER protocol. Um, in my other work, I am a doctoral candidate and research coordinator on the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study. So that's usually my gig, more around alcohol harm reduction, but I'm happy to be here today. Um, at the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research and at the University of Victoria. So thank, thanks everyone for coming today. Thanks, Megan. So about the start of the pandemic, um, you know, I many of us had started working in various settings and we noticed that there were some significant changes that were coming along with broad sweeping public health interventions and true here in BC we've been in a public health emergency for over five years now. But when we saw closures of borders and people being encouraged to physically distance and to self isolate and to quarantine. We started to notice that there was also a significant shift in the illegal drug supply and that despite having overdose prevention services available and naloxone available, the mix of reductions in services available to people and reductions in consistency of the drug market, um, we saw a, a huge increase in the volatility of the drug supply. And right around April of 2020, the BC government introduced their risk mitigation guidance documents, which were set to enable prescribers to provide a safe supply to people who are at risk of overdose. And myself and other nurses like Megan, who worked alongside me in various uh, settings during the pandemic, um, started trying to help people navigate it. And Megan, she said that her world was managed alcohol, but there's definitely a lot of crossovers. And we saw a lot of the same barriers that were erected through medicalization of services. As time progressed, uh, the uh, organization that I work for uh, received a funding grant from the federal government substance use and addiction program known as SUOP to develop and implement a flexible model for safe supply in Victoria. Uh, and it was that 
there where we really started to, to work to challenge what was available to people and how can we make it more accessible. Now, what's really unfortunate is that this graphic here that you're seeing is from May of 2021, and we're still experiencing the worst iteration of the overdose crisis here in BC. We're still seeing 5.2 people die every single day in BC. And what's really awful is that despite having safe supply available on paper, uh, of the roughly 90 to 100,000 British Columbians who are at risk of overdose, less than 4% of them are actually able to access a safe supply. Last estimates from the BCCSU was 3,329 people were on safe supply uh, out of that 90 to 100,000. So what we know is there's definitely some problems. So what we did with the Safer Victoria initiative was we began with a community engagement process where we spoke to prescribers, academics, people with lived and living experience, and we got their initial feedback on what was wrong with the current safe supply options for people and what they saw as necessary in order for us to uh, actually see you know, some progress in, in, in the overdose crisis and how can we actually make safe supply effective and accessible for people who need it. Uh, that, engagement report mostly told us what we already know, which was that offering people Dilaudid through the context of COVID-19 was really problematic. Uh, framing safe supply around withdrawal management and addiction medicine had all kinds of issues and, and concerns that came up. Uh, and that ultimately people were wanting something that was actually going to be accessible to them and not delivered through the lens of a medicalized system. Now, the SAFER project got started right away, and so we were initially given 10 months of funding uh, to develop and implement a flexible model for safe supply during a global pandemic. And if that sounds ridiculous, that's because it is very challenging to do that. And so what we did was uh, we went out and started doing the work right away, and there was myself and Systems Navigator and people with lived experience who were working on our team. Uh, and we started connecting with people in homeless encampments right away and tried to support them accessing a safe supply just through individual advocacy by calling doctors and, and hoping that one of them would be able to prescribe. But meanwhile, there was a whole bunch of really great research that was being done through a partnership with Solid Outreach and the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research and, and with Bernie Polly on point for that. What they did was they created a concept map uh, to ask people what they felt like uh, an effective and accessible safe supply would be. And so they did seven initial focus groups. Uh, they did focus groups with people who uh, were sleeping in the parks. They did focus groups with people who were in the hotels. They did focus groups with people who use stimulants, people who use opiates, people who inject, people who smoke their drugs, uh, people who are engaged in sex work and people who identify as First Nations, Indigenous and Métis. And they asked them all the same question. I would access safe supply if, and they got everybody to fill those out. And there was a series of sorting and, and screening and going through to create six clusters that people identified as really key for safe supply to be effective and accessible. And was that, that was that they wanted the right dose and the right drugs for them. They wanted safe, positive and welcoming spaces. They wanted safe supply and other services that are accessible. They wanted to be treated with respect they wanted to be able to get their safe supply easily, and they wanted something that helped them function and improve their quality of life, most importantly, as defined by them. And so this is where the SAFER program has been grounding itself and trying to propel itself forward through uh, really medicalized barriers. We operate what we call a peer nurse-led model, but it's actually uh, more interdisciplinary focus than that. Uh, at the center of our project is a person-centered approach to increasing access to pharmaceutical alternatives to the toxic drug supply. Uh, we try to support our participants to take the lead on identifying their needs related to substance use and support them through our inter interdisciplinary team. Uh, and the reason for that is because we know a lot of our participants have gone through a series of uh, different services and treatment options and, and ultimately don't want to be on treatment and have experienced a lot of harms at the hands of the medical system. And so in order to increase access to safe supply, <coughs> we wanted things to be flexible and community based. We have outreach workers with lived and living experience, uh, and they're really critical in helping us make connections and help people follow through and attend appointments. Uh, and we also have nurses who work to full scope and essentially help what we call a medical light model where the nurses do the primary amounts of assessments. 
um, and they work with participants to develop recommendations for what would be the right medications for them. We have six physicians now who are on our team who do the prescribing for us. And we also have systems navigators who offer psychosocial and practical supports. About 90% of our active participants are engaging with system navigators to get things like birth certificate, IDs, um, income assistance, housing applications, legal assistance, uh, and anything in between. Because what we found very early on is that um, supporting people with a safe supply isn't just about the medications or the drug. There's so many other things that need to be navigated in order to make that truly accessible for them. Now, when I talk about developing a flexible model for safe supply, uh, it's not just because the word flexible is cool to say, it's because it's actually a definition by the federal government. There's three different categories of safe supply as defined by the Substance Use and Addiction Program with the federal government. There's a traditional model for safe supply, which they deem inclusive of opioid agonist therapy like methadone and suboxone, uh, as well as IO, like injectable opioid agonist therapy clinics. Uh, which are medicalized and they're embedded within addiction, addiction medicine treatment services. Then there's the enhanced models, which include things like TIOT, the tablet injectable opioid agonist therapy that you might see at the Molson OPS. Uh, and these are also medicalized and embedded within addiction treatment, but also can have a little bit more flexibility and oftentimes can be in, embedded within existing overdose prevention services. Uh, and then there's this category called flexible over here where the star is next to and that doesn't actually exist yet except for safer trying to figure that out um, and these are ones that are supposed to be low threshold uh, harm reduction and public health informed embedded within primary care embedded within an scs or an ops or, or a cts which is ontario's version of an ops or an scs or housing with pathways to health, social and addiction treatment services. Uh, and it's really about delivering through that harm reduction approach. This is not treatment. Uh, this is not the BCCSU's risk mitigation guidance. We're not mitigating the risk of COVID-19. Uh, we're not you know, trying to coerce people into treatment. We're mitigating the risk of a toxic drug supply made ever more toxic by criminalization and the ongoing war on drugs. And the goals really that people uh, is, is what's self-identified by participants. What they tell us are their goals and priorities. Uh, and the results are quite wonderful actually. Uh, we talk to all of our participants and we gather the feedback from them in terms of whether or not they feel like the program is helpful to them. Um, and we put all of this data together. Uh, and it's not that often, Megan, that you see in pilot projects and novel studies that you see a lot of self-reported or notable impacts being included because my experience with literature is with a lot of these programs, they wanna see quantifiable evidence, things like uh, urine drug screens and treatment adherence and ability to follow up on, on appointments. So what we have here is a breakdown of our participants at one point in time in the spring of 2021 where we polled as many as of them that we could within a matter of two weeks and we asked them how this project good bad or ugly was actually helping them uh, and so participants number of participants reported that they have had been able to reduce the harms from substances that they've been able to reduce use uh, that they've been able to engage in more safer practices that they've had decreased cravings uh, decreased physical withdrawal symptoms, healed wounds, improved mental health, increased connections to healthcare, less reliance on street economy, improved overall function as defined by them, reduced use of illegal substances connected to housing and social supports. And you know, what's really great is that when we were able to meet people's needs, we had all of these intangible outcomes happen. Like people were telling us um, like, hey, I was able to go to work today for the first time in a long time, or, um, I connected with my family again for the first time in years because, uh, you know, like I, I felt like I could actually be supported to go and see them again. And so we've had a lot of really great outcomes in a short amount of time. 
But then we needed to actually uh, change things up because at the time, all we were doing with SAFER was a medicalized model uh, through outreach. And so we were having a team of nurses and peers and, and systems navigators go out in the community and connect with folks uh, out on the street. And all we could offer them was tablet safe supply, which was like um, pill form of Dilaudid or oxycodone. And while it was great, we had written our own uh, clinical prescriber guidance on these different substances. What we knew from our service user design engagement was that uh, 14 tablets of Dilaudid wasn't enough for even one use for a lot of people. As the pandemic rages on and the toxic and volatile drug supply continues to get more toxic and volatile, people's tolerances are going up as well. And what was once potentially effective like tablet hydromorphone or tablet oxycodone uh, has now been outpaced by fentanyl that's on the street. Uh, and so we knew that we needed to actually continue to pivot. So when SAFER received its two years of funding, we opened a clinic and we actually built the clinic out of uh, an old pizza restaurant. And we did it really quickly so that we could start supporting people. And if you see there, this is the video of our clinic that we've got uh, different booths. We've got the MySafe opioid vending machine. Uh, we've got a med room that was built out of a walk-in refrigerator. Uh, and we started offering people three different types of fentanyl-based safe supply. Uh, folks could either go on to the fentanyl patch program, and the fentanyl patch program is intended to be a long-acting opioid replacement of methadone or cadian or suboxone, uh, which gets changed every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or at every 48 to 72 hour increments. Uh, we also started a sufentanyl injectable or sublingual program. So we have participants who uh, can either inject sufentanyl up to four times a day, uh, or they can uh, take it sublingually. And then we also have a new Fentora fentanyl tablet program. And Fentora is a dissolvable pill, which can either go buccally in the cheek or it can go under the tongue. Uh, and it dissolves really quickly. It's effervescent, so it's like a fizzy kind of action. Uh, and it can go all the way up to 2000 micrograms BID, which uh, is actually something that can be effective in meeting someone's tolerances. And in a short amount of time, the clinic's been open for two and a half months. Uh, we are currently working with 94 active participants. Of those 94, 25 of them are on the fentanyl patch. Uh, 12 of them are on sufentanyl. Seven of them are currently on Fentora. And we had seven people who had decided that the patch wasn't for them, but of that seven, three of them have been brought on to Sufentanil, which is really cool. In our program, we have a bit of a continuum within our services that if one doesn't work out for someone, then that doesn't mean that the program isn't a good fit for them. It means we can keep trying other things that might be a better fit for them. And over a year, because we just had our birthday, uh, we've connected 149 people to a safe supply. Now, this work is really uh, controversial. It's really contested oftentimes. There's a lot of old school mentalities. There's a lot of agree and safe supply in principle, but not so much in practice. And so we have to do a lot of gathering evidence and we have to do a lot of um, showing exactly why, uh, why, why we do this type of work. And in order to do that, we lean on things like the data from the BC CDC that shows people less than less than 1% of people who are dying by overdose in BC are dying by prescribed pharmaceuticals. The vast majority of them are dying by the toxic drug supply. And, and, and the fact that it's continuing to get more volatile and the concentration continues to get up and the adulteration continues to go up as well. We also have to lean on the ethics. Uh, and, and I think Megan has something to say about that. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Um, so, as Corey was saying, um, a big challenge, I think, in bringing on particularly prescribers to the concept of providing safe supplies, um, their professional responsibility and um, risk. So, as you can see from some of the quotes here, I believe this is from the ethics analysis document that I can't quite remember who the exec authors were, Corey, if you remember. Um, Dr. Klug. Duke. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Kluge. That's great. Um, so with that, I think that there has been, you know, 
kind of a misunderstanding, I think, within the medical community around what are we doing in safe supply and what are prescribers' um, responsibilities and roles. And as nurses, we've been involved kind of, I think, in between um, the person and the prescriber and kind of trying to mitigate um, some of these barriers that people have been experiencing um, and accessing safe supply. So um, I think one thing from the, from what we've learned um, is that prescribers are often really focused on the risk of diversion. And that comes from a certain assumption that necessarily diversion is a bad thing. Um, we don't actually know from research or not whether or not, you know, as this quote says, um, could diversion potentially be a um, something that, you know, is a consequence of a person accessing safe supply that is not meeting their needs. So as Corey, as Corey was saying, um, previous to the fentanyl program, um, people act, um, trying to use um, medications like hydromorphone and oxycodone, um, or is it, even if that is occurring, is you know, um, the contribution of diversion to the drug market, does that potentially have a positive impact um, compared to, you know, um, the possibility of uh, another community member using from the illicit supply. But overall, there's this assumption, right, that we should really focus on specific risks. And um, I mean, I can, I've seen this in my own practice in terms of alcohol harm reduction is there's a uh, medicalization of what we're trying to do in safe supply and harm reduction that really dilutes kind of the ethical framework of harm, harm reduction in practice. So in medical ethics, there's a real focus on individual harms and um, reduction of certain um, harms such as overdose and maybe um, prescribers also want to see um, a reduction in use over time as well. Whereas in harm reduction, I think where we need to bring the medical community along or, we, or potentially if this is not possible, um, you know, there's a focus more on the rights of the person first, as well as what is their definition of success and how might safe supply contribute to their quality of life beyond just some of these outcomes that we're looking at around um, diversion, um, change in use patterns, and um, overdose as well. So it's important to define what exactly are the outcomes that we're looking for. I think in a harm reduction framework, it's what the community tells us is good and what the individual tells us is good. Um, but again, this focus on risk and liability, I think, has created a lot of assumptions in practice that have really slowed down progress in terms of recognition of some of the other um, benefits of safe supply that Corey was talking about in terms of people talking about, for example, not having to live in um, survival as much as they were prior to accessing safe supply. Um, and the message that, you know, has, off, has also been given to people is this thought that, you know, we're going to assume that this is a risky practice because it is not researched even though from a harm reduction perspective, we might say this is a pragmatic and common sense practice. Um, so, you know, beginning of a relationship where you're telling the person, I don't trust you to be able to use this potential tool um, to, be, to be safer in your use, rather than giving people the chance to, you know, engage and potentially, you know, develop their own ways to use safer and then also to be able to um, experience some of their own um, subjective benefits as well. 
Um, Corey, you can go to the next slide. I, I can try. Um, yeah, I also, you know, just to your point there, where that was so well made about diversion, is that like we've had people come onto our program after accessing diverted safe supply. Like they've come to us and been like, I couldn't get my dope and my buddy shared some with me. And then I was like, oh my God, where do I get that? And people have actually been brought into through because because diversion is often community care, right? Like this, the people who use drugs uh, often take care of each other and that shouldn't be deemed a punishable offense. So uh, what we did in order to try to pull together the ethics and the evidence and the outcomes from the safer project and to try and put it all together so that we can empower more prescribers to engage in this type of work other than just the six of ours who are here in Victoria was we created a practice brief uh, and we did that in partnership with Sicer and with Bernie Pauly and with Megan Brown, and Karen Urbanovsky and and folks from SOLID and folks from AVI. And we wrote this document, which basically uh, compiled all of the existing literature and rationale for why we do what we do here at SAFER. And so there was an intentional divorcing away from uh, the BCCS use risk mitigation guidance documents and from some of those more mainstream but restrictive and addiction medicine approaches, uh, because we really wanted to offer an option for people to say, like, if you're a prescriber out there and you want to do safe supply, just know that there is options for you to do that. And there's different ways that you can do that. And it can be delivered in certain ways, or it can also be delivered in under the lens of harm reduction and anti-oppressive practices. Now, that is to say that we are not uh, completely, uh, you know, like it's great to talk about the good parts about safer, but we are still a medicalized model and we try really hard not to be and we push out against some of the medical barriers that we're going to talk about soon. But ultimately, we are, you know, it's a prescriber driven model. We need prescribers to be able to write the prescriptions, which means that there need to be the appropriate protocols in place. Uh, and so on top of that practice brief, uh, Heather and myself uh, actually co-wrote our prescriber guidance for uh, community-based prescribing. Heather says she helps Corey a little bit, or M Megan says that she helps Corey a little bit, but, but she actually did quite a bit. Uh, and we, we wrote those uh, prescriber guidance documents uh, and wrote them for the fentanyl prescribing and also for the community-based tablet prescribing. Uh, and we did it also in consultation with Dr. Christy Sutherland at Safer Vancouver and the PHS program. And so we're starting to develop a community of practice between prescribers and other clinical teams so that we can try to do this work a little bit differently. Now, where do we find ourselves? This graphic is called the Safe Supply Continuum uh, and was, was made by yours truly because there is some important things to note about uh, Safe Supply when it's delivered through a medical model. Um, the fact is, is that we know that medicalized models are really high barrier and really challenging for people to access, but right now, they're the best that we have. There doesn't exist another way to get pharmaceuticals into people's hands. And that's really unfortunate, but it is the reality we live in. And so if you think about the evolution of cannabis regulation, at one point in time, it actually had to go through the hands of prescribers. And doctors were like, I don't want to do this. This doesn't make sense for me to be doing this. And that's pretty much what they're saying right now too. But until we start to develop a model that's delivered through a public health approach or a regulated approach or something that's more accessible, uh, that probably is it coincided with uh, decriminalization, then this is what we have. And so in the safe supply in continuum, we have clinical delivery, which includes injectable opioid agonist therapy, tie out clinics. <coughs> it is the most studied model. So it's where we have the most available existing literature, but it's also highly rooted in paternalism and has a lot of flawed metrics for success, like urine drug screens, like treatment adherence, and there is a significant history of mistrust due to harms towards people who have used drugs who have tried to access these services. And you have a harm reduction approach that sits in the middle, which includes our services here and embedding in overdose prevention services and supervised consumption services and the MySafe vending machine. Now, these are obviously rooted towards trying to reduce death and the harms from the drug war. And they're 
uh, a stepping stone to get to where we really need to get to, which is drug use or liberation, uh, decriminalization of people who use drugs, heroin, compassion clubs, legalization, regulation, reconciliation, and decolonization. And this is where we need to get to. And right now we're at an awkward transition phase. Yeah, just um, building on what Corey was saying is I think we get lots of questions from communities across Canada in terms of, you know, how can we be doing what you're doing? And is it really the solution to, con to continue to try to fit harm, harm reduction and safe supply within a medical model? Um, knowing that, you know, with SAFER, for example, you have a group of very committed prescribers and people who are ethically, um, you know, on the same page in terms of safe supply being a pragmatic response in a public health in emergency, but implementing that within a system in which, you know, the knowledge of people who use drugs are not valued, medical knowledge is valued overall, um, that, you know, we work in a system that um, takes a really long time. So, I mean, this is not great for me to say as a researcher, but, you know, the, the process of going through pilot studies and waiting for findings to come out that, um, you know, communities already know is a really slow and ineffective process. And so, really, I think for us to move towards any type of really um, widely implemented and accessible safe supply, we're kind of stuck in this middle middle piece here, as Corey said, where we're trying to just do the best that we can with what we have, um, but there's a lot more work to be done with, you know, challenging the entire um, entirely uh, paternalistic model, and I would say, you know, ch challenging. Um, I think the power and validity of addiction medicine itself, um, thinking that I don't know if safe supply really fits within the model of treatment, um, potentially could move towards there and what does treatment even mean? But, um, and the other point I was going to make was around, you know, even if we do get to the point of having a legalized and regulated drug supply, um, I personally think that we'll still have, you know, creep of addiction medicine into, um, you know, truly trying to provide a anti, um, anti oppressive and decolonized um, safe supply of drugs. I can, you know, use the example of alcohol harm reduction because I always do. Alcohol is a legal substance, and for years it's been um, managed alcohol has been implemented by largely nonprofits outside of the healthcare model and there's been mainly healthcare teams that have come in and support um, that have come in and supported communities um, in terms of they would handle the alcohol harm reduction plans themselves and then you would have um, RNs and uh, primary care docs um, social workers coming into programs and maybe just consulting. Um, but what we've kind of seen during COVID, particularly in BC, is a lot of health authorities taking up taking up MAP within addiction medicine and requiring things like prescriptions and creating these high barrier programs that are you know, actually going kind of backwards from um, the work that's been done and trying to demedicalize um, that kind of support. So I think, you know, as we're moving towards drug user liberation as the foundation of creating, you know, um, a safe supply of drugs, um, we also need to dismantle um, how it is that we position ourselves as health providers in the role of um, supporting people to access a safe Supply. So, um, a lot of work to be done, and it's sometimes hard to talk about Corey because it's like, yeah, Safer is doing great work, but we know that it's like way more work than it has to be. 
kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Within this system. <laughs> it is. Uh, and and you're like alluding to my my least favorite thing ever, which is incrementalism. Right. And like we're just inchworming our way towards maybe a potential solution. And that's all we see chronically uh, in politics. And we're going to see a lot of it during the upcoming federal election is there's going to be a lot of promises of half half measures, but nobody's going to make an outright commitment to full decriminalization or regulation. The things that advocates, experts, people with lived and living experience of criminalized drug use have been asking for and have been showing the evidence for. Uh, we'll see some mutated half version of that that nobody actually wants and will be clunky and we'll have to try and make it work until we can smooth it out into something that actually works and it's incredibly inefficient uh, and takes a lot of effort and it also is subject to all kinds of issues because it, like with pilot studies that you alluded to Megan uh, like there's they are always low capacity the, and and there's always a limited amount of who can actually access these services and a, and a finite amount of people who are lucky enough to gain access while well, you have to stand there and, and you know decline other referrals because there's just not enough space for people. And they're also subject chronically to precarious funding. And um, that creates, you know, this like weird colonial competition where every program has to work against each other and to try and make sure that they can assure their next funding cycle and it's not really how it should work uh, the system is is not designed for innovation and as you said like there's the one of the big drawbacks that you see from people who don't want to prescribe safe supplies they say well there's no existing evidence for that uh, well, you can't in a public health intervention do a randomized control trial and, you know, outright say give one group an intervention and watch the other die by a toxic drug supply. And so these public health interventions are always subject to confounding variables, um, you know, because we don't know, you know, what exactly has shifted the tide and what exactly has made the most improvement for people. And and those are just some of the the many issues that we find that we're finding with trying to deliver services through an addiction medicine lens. And so when we look at the difference between harm reduction and addiction medicine and where uh, safer Victoria really finds itself at the intersections of harm reduction and addiction medicine, because we're trying really hard to be flexible in harm reduction, but we're always uh, beholden to the fact that it is still delivered through a prescriber model is that uh, when harm reduction, we see that the client is a member of their own care team and that their needs are identified by themselves and upheld by the team. In the addiction medicine approach and what we see with the risk mitigation guidance and the broader availability of safe supply, we see that the doses are often too low to have the desired effect and clients are often expected to take opioid agonist therapy. In fact, in many programs and services, clients are required to go on opioid agonist therapy in order to access their safe supply. And one of the most important principles of harm reduction is that any options for treatment are based in evidence, but they're also non-coercive. And so we see that there's right here, this kind of uh, grind that we find ourselves at. In harm reduction, prescriptions are not provided as a means to manage withdrawal, but also to provide a safer alternative to the toxic drug supply. Uh, whereas in addiction medicine, the medicines are being provided uh, to meet the not being provided to meet their needs, but they're actually being provided uh, to manage their withdrawal and to make sure that they don't get sick. When the first risk mitigation guidance came out, they were actually not designed to reduce the impacts of overdose or to reduce the likelihood of overdose. They were actually uh, developed to reduce transmission of COVID-19. Uh, the belief was that the uh, people were going to get sick with COVID and they needed to isolate. They were going to get dope sick and their tolerance was going to shift. And so they were going to provide these uh, medications over a short term to prevent that from happening. And that actually isn't a true safe supply. In harm reduction, there's peers, nurses, systems navigators, and physicians that work together to address the needs. Uh, and what we see in addiction medicine is a huge focus on urine drug screens, misdose protocols, and flawed metrics to use for success. And then in harm reduction, we have follow up with care teams that assure the issues uh, are addressed with accessing and are routinely addressed. And in the SAFER project, uh, as things got worse for people in homeless encampments, and we found that people weren't able to access the pharmacy and they weren't able to get to the pharmacy every single day, 
we developed a med delivery program. And so we met people where they were at literally. Uh, and when we noticed that there was people overdosing in the parks and that the risk was going up over check week in October, uh, we set up an unsanctioned OPS in one of the parks for a week. And not only did we do that, but we embedded a nurse in there so we can do intakes for safe supply. That's not the kind of flexibility in working in the gray that you often see through addiction medicine models. Safer Victoria is also linked to the provincial risk mitigation guidance evaluation. Uh, and so there is a provincial evaluation that's happening of all types of safe supply prescribing that's happening across the province. Uh, that includes qualitative interviews, quantitative surveys and chart reviews. And so there's going to be uh, a lot of data that's gonna come out. We also have our own evaluation tools through Safer that we use and that we've been utilizing as well. So there's lots more data to come out, hopefully to support folks in being able to do these types of services. Well, Megan, feel free to like alternate with me on this one, but we also uh, over the last year with uh, speaking with our staff, uh, specifically our, our staff who have lived in living experience, uh, those who have been trying over a year to connect people to a safe supply, We've asked them what they've learned from trying to support people and connect people to a safe supply and enter the safer top 10. And so the staff came up with the top 10 lessons that they've learned uh, in trying to provide a safe supply through the pandemic. And the first one is that uh, the drugs must match the needs. Drug tolerances are outpacing the effectiveness of current pharmaceutical alternatives without options that include powdered fentanyl, diacetyl morphine, and other formulations that can match potency and preferred route of consumption, the illegal supply will continue to prevail. Uh, and that's really true, especially for people who smoke their drugs uh, here in BC and abroad in Canada. Uh, the people who are dying most by overdose are people who smoke their drugs, and yet there is no safe supply option yet for people who smoke their drugs. I can do number two because it's my favorite, I think. Measures for success need to include self-reported benefits. And I talked a little bit of, um, about this. So participants, they're telling us that they're using less and they feel better for having to access um, a safe supply. They tell us they have more stability in their lives. Um, many have reported decreased reliance on the illegal market. Some have stopped using fentanyl altogether. Others tell us that they experience less withdrawal or dope sickness that should count more than the results of a urine drug screen. People are benefiting from the provision of pharmaceutical alternatives. So again, um, easy you know, to define success based on one or two indicators, but you know, success is gonna be defined based on what questions you ask, right? So a lot of research in the past has looked at um, overdose deaths as the main indicator. And you know, we know that um, there are many other benefits just from our own practice, um, and I'm sure lots of nurses here on the call would know too, things that aren't documented in research that um, need to be documented to bring people on board, and hopefully, um, you know, we can start valuing those things more. I could do the next one too, Corey. So people who use drugs are the experts of their own experiences and relationships with substances. So, um, you know, decision-making without proper collaboration with people who use drugs is usually the norm, um, unfortunately. So this results in highly clinical, high barrier programs that don't match the diverse needs of people who use drugs. Um, participants seem to have much higher success in continued engagement on safer supply when they're asked, what do you want from this? As opposed to a practitioner telling them what the outcome should be. Safer supply should be more effective if we had better options to support people who are able to be honest about wanting to feel euphoric effects from their substances along with other goals. So again, that means I think valuing the knowledge of people who use drugs in terms of dosing itself, you know, um, I mean, I can probably, I mean, Corey, you would probably say the same, that I have no idea how much people actually need. Um, we're still kind of figuring that out in a very slow way, but maybe if we would have started earlier with um, listening to people who use drugs, it'd be different. Yeah, there was a great presentation recently by Substance, which is the Vancouver Island Drug Checkers, and they actually, um, I saved the slide that they showed, but it was comparing morphine equivalencies of what people are using on the streets compared to um, medical 
uh, morphine equivalents. And so there is some like estimation that like if somebody tells you that they're using five points a day, that could be upwards to 5,000 uh, milligrams of morphine a day. And we're not even touching people's tolerances. We're not even, when, when we see safe supply programming that stops at 14 tabs of Dilaudid, that might have been an intervention that was effective back in, in 2015 before the fentanyl uh, market kind of got infiltrated and, and became more volatile. And so uh, we definitely have to make sure that we're continuously honoring what people who with lived experience, people who use drugs are telling us when they tell us that like they, they need something stronger, they need something more effective. Number four is that service delivery models that are flexible and lead with people with lived and living experience are integral in fostering trust and connections to care. This is often what makes services not super scalable is that you have to be able to work in the gray. And so safer, the entire program has been this very organic and often challenging experience because every time something new would happen or a trend would emerge, we had to shift and we had to pivot and, and try something different. And when we got feedback from our clients that something wasn't working, uh, we had to make, make something else and, and make something else available to them uh, right away. And so it's difficult to be flexible, but it's also really worth it. Number five is that the provision of pharmaceutical alternatives through an addiction medicine model is limiting the impacts and reach of overdose prevention and harm reduction. Uh, making opioid agonist therapy as a condition of safe supply is coercion, even if it isn't intended to be. Number six is that people who use drugs take care of each other when drugs are shared, sold, or exchanged is often about providing care and meeting basic needs. Uh, many participants at SAFER, um, you know, have self-referred after accessing diverted safe supply. It was a gateway for them to seek out their own SAFER supply. Rather than punishing people for their hard-earned resilience and survival skills, SAFER supply efforts seek to understand how drugs are actually used in communities and to respectfully engage people from that understanding instead of the war on drugs mentality. Number seven is that safe supply is just one part of a more equitable access to health and well being. Providing a safe supply is a harm reduction entry point to addressing other basic needs and priorities, securing housing, livable income, access to health care, and a caring community to feel part of all of, or all of these are a necessity. Number eight is that participants engage better in safer supply programs when working with staff who have lived and living experience. One of, our, uh, one of our support workers, Jacqueline, in a, in a news article was quoted saying uh, that she's just so happy and encouraged by the developing relationships with folks that she works with and that uh, she, you know, like she's able to bridge connections with trust and she's able to help people uh, come on board when maybe there would be some mistrust or some hesitancy to engage with the care team. Number nine is that contempt, discrimination, stigma, and paternalism towards people who use drugs is a public health and human rights emergency. And we continue to see that and it continues to be pervasive uh, in the work that we do. And the final uh, lesson from our top 10 is that safer supply is not the answer. That's not the panacea to the toxic drug poisoning crisis. The best action we can take is decriminalization, legalization, and regulation and a continuum of models that ranges from medicalized services all the way to heroin compassion clubs and regulation and dispensaries so that people wherever they're at have options that can meet their needs. And that's the end of the presentation. And so we've left, uh, I said 15 minutes, but it actually ended up just being 10 minutes, but we've got room for some questions. Uh, one of the things that I'll do while you think about if you have any questions for us, and please feel free to unmute or, or go on video and, and ask away. It's a smaller group, so it, please feel free just to jump in. What I am going to do is I'm just going to put our practice brief here in the chat. Uh, so that if anybody has any uh, desire to read more about the project and how we came about uh, the work that we're doing, then you have full access here. Hi, Corey, it's Tracy Day. Can you tell me, has anyone tried smoking the Fentora? We're starting that this week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, we, you know, it's been the ongoing, like, biggest need that we find ways to support people who smoke their drugs. Mm -hmm. And we continuously, like, hear, like, whispers of, like, oh, you know, smokable diacetylmorphine is just around the corner or powdered fentanyl is just around the corner. And then you realize, even if it is, it's very unlikely that prescribers are going to be comfortable prescribing powdered fentanyl or, or powdered diacetylmorphine out in community. So what is it actually going to be? Where's the middle ground? And when, with the tablet program, we added oxycodone to our safe supply prescribing because people can smoke their oxys. And, and traditionally, I've reported in the past when being able to access oxys that they smoked it. Uh, but for higher potency um, uh, medications, the only option that we really have is the fento fentanyl pill, the Fentora tablet. And so we've done consultation with people who use drugs across the province. Uh, and we've heard that Fentora is a smokable option. And so starting this week, uh, we're developing a safer inhalation site out of the, out of the backspace, the courtyard of our, of our clinic and we will let people smoke their Fentora. Oh, that's perfect. That's kind of what I was planning on doing for like the safe supply prescribing up here with Fentora. But I, I haven't heard any feedback, so that's what I was hoping to find yeah, out. I guess, I guess we need someone <laughs> to go first, hey? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so. I, and I was just hoping that patients would let me know if they, once they tried it. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna give it a go, and hopefully, I, I I know from like again from anecdotal standpoint that I there are people who have told me that it is smokable, but there's not a lot of uh, you know like uh, existing literature on the smokability of certain pharmaceuticals. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're we're working on it as as we speak. Yeah, but I mean, patients they tell you so. Yeah, well, the, the one issue was that we didn't previously have a safer inhalation site set up, but now we now we do. So ready to go. So, um, if you're so is it only on site or are prescribers comfortable just using it like a safe supply from the drugstore? That's what been, I, that was my intent on doing it here. There have been no uh, community based prescribing to date of of Ventura. It's all witness consumption out of the clinic. Hmm. I don't have, I'll let someone else talk, sorry. I see that Heather Morris has asked if we're looking into diacetylmorphine and absolutely we've got our finger on the pulse for that. And as soon as it is available, um, we're planning on, on bridging into that as well. It's not yet, and we definitely need the province to move forward on covering it as well. I have a question. Um, I'm Joanna and Prince George. Thank you, first of all, for this. It gives me so much hope um, for what things can look like. Um, and I think I have two questions. One, so you mentioned, I'm not super familiar with Vancouver Island and how the programs are structured, but it sounds like you're operating outside of the health authority. Is that correct? We're federally funded. Um, okay. So we're funded through the substance use and addiction program. And so uh, safer is not, um, yeah, we're not, we're not overly connected with the health authority, although we do have, uh, really strong relationships with the health authority and like referral pathways between each other. Uh, VIHA is starting, a an IO clinic, um, uh, based out of the Harbor at the OPS. And so, uh, there's the, the intention that we have good referral pathways between each other so that if, you know, somebody's needs is met better through injectable Dilaudid than our fentanyl programming, that they would be able to navigate both those systems with ease. Right on. Okay. Um, thank you. And my other question was just, you had a slide that had kind of a comparison medicine and then you had the kind of um, then diagram with the confirmation bias is there a way that that can be shareable because I just love how that's articulated and I think it would be really helpful for some of our conversations where we're trying to differentiate between kind of old school addiction medicine and and moving in a different direction Please. a bit cheeky I mean I've, I've, I made them I made them myself and oftentimes I make infographics when I'm frustrated because I'm like I need to explain this to someone in a way that they can just look at it and understand it so yeah I, I think that that's um, fine to be shared uh, how to do that is the question 
Um, I think my email was at the end of the survey, and so I'm or at the end of the power or presentation. So I'm just going to put it up here. And if you want to shoot me an email, I can send you some graphics from today's presentation, and, and that offer can be extended to anybody else who is looking for it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Evan, are there options for non opioids and stims in your programs? Like, do you mean in terms of non opioids, are you referring to stimulants? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, so we have stimulant safe supply options through our community-based prescribing. Um, the options are dexedrine, Ritalin, and uh, mixed amphetamines or Adderall. And um, what we found is like, for the most part, it's not really like a great fit for people who are using side and who, you know, are trying to whether they're trying to stay up all night or uh, experience that euphoric effect that doesn't come with a with an ADHD type medication. Um, not a lot of people were having their needs met, but we ended up actually preserving a small cohort of our folks who were on stimulant safe supply, uh, who were likely walking around with undiagnosed ADHD or untreated ADHD for a significant amount of time. Uh, and our doctors and our nursing team have been able to work with them to reverse engineer an ADHD diagnosis and get them on the proper meds. And uh, those are the folks who we, uh, when we first talked to about their methamphetamine use, who would say things like, well, I need to use this to focus, or I, you know, I use this because it helps me think. And so there's been a small group who have been um, supported really well through that, but it's um, not really like the it hasn't been supported well enough to roll out strong stimulant safe supply options. Uh, and there's been lots of conversations about things like uh, powdered cocaine and, and other drugs that would actually produce some kind of desired euphoric effect, but it's still very challenging to, to kind of get that ball moving forward. Um, we have time for one more question, if there is one. And if not, then I will just say, I uh, really appreciate everybody coming today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our first webinar back with HRNA in a while, and we're gonna plan to do these more regularly. Uh, hope you're all keeping well uh, amidst this ongoing, very challenging times that we are living in.